Good afternoon. My name is Will Ryan, and I am pleased to introduce our guest today. You're listening to Impressions on CTSB. My guest today is Dr. Michael Fine. He is a really wonderful man. Michael and I met last September on Nantucket Island, and when we began to talk, I was so interested in what he had to say, I knew we had to bring him into the studio for this report. Michael is a writer, a community organizer, family physician, and public health provocateur, I love that word, devoted to health care reform and the care of underserved populations. Wonderful. His titles, current titles, he's the Senior Clinical and Population Health Officer for Blackstone Valley Community Healthcare in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. He's also the Chief Health Strategist for the City of Central Falls, a large compact city in Rhode Island. Some years back, I'm going to list this one because my, my uh, alma mater is Brown University where he was on the faculty. He was the Clinical Assistant Professor of Family Medicine for the Warren Alpert School of Medicine of Brown University. Michael's had many jobs and publications, and I'd like to focus, oh, since 1979, I might add, I would like to start, and, and we'll talk today about your book. It's called Healthcare Revolt, How to Organize, Build a Healthcare System, and Resuscitate Democracy, all at the same time. And a review I read says the book touts the importance of education, healthy food, and primary care centers embedded in dense community networks over specialized medical care, mounting a sustained critique of pharmaceutical companies who still who shill for drugs, that's a good word, that people don't need. Wow. Three facts I culled out of my research. Current medical system is destroying the economy and the nation. U.S. healthcare costs are twice as high as elsewhere. And the marketplace where few profit from the public's ill health. What a background. And when we started talking way back in Nantucket in September, I was enthralled at the, the energy you had and your initiative. And I appreciate it if you could share a little bit more about your travels over the last year or two and what impact you're having. Thanks, Will, and it's wonderful to be here. Thanks for making this happen. Um, I think most of my travels over the last couple of years have been about this book, Healthcare Revolt, uh, which is really a challenge uh, to healthcare workers and to the general public to sort of stand up and demand a healthcare system, understanding that what we have is a market, not a system. Um, we don't have a way to make sure everybody gets what they need from a healthcare perspective. Um, and when you compare us to other nations, we pale by comparison. We are, we, as you said, uh, healthcare in the United States costs on average twice as much as the other industrialized countries. Yes. But that's as, as the average of the other industrialized countries. It turns out if you look at the countries that have the best health outcomes, that means the longest life expectancy and the least infant mortality, they pay 60% less than we pay and get far better results. What we have is kind of an embarrassment because we pay so much, twice as much as the average of, of all those other advanced countries. But we are rated about 64th in the world now for life expectancy, and our life expectancy has been falling for the last three years. Oh my goodness. Um, other nations, which pay, as I said, 60% less, have infant mortality rates that are a third of ours on average, um, but they're a ninth of the infant mortality rates experienced by African-American women. So we've got lots of challenges and no real consensus about how to build a healthcare system for the well, United States. Uh, let's start with some of the facts you just mentioned because I think that's uh, a realistic. And my question is, when you're traveling around speaking to various and sundry groups and talking to people, what percentage of people are, are agreeing with the fact that our system is really broken? Most people seem to understand it intuitively. They haven't had quite the presentation of the details. Okay. 
but they sense that something's off. You know, they all know that it's cost that it costs too much, and they all know that you know people don't all have access the kind of ac access to care that they need in their own communities in the way they need it. But I don't think you know anybody's been able to organize the movement that we're going to need to build a healthcare system, and that's why people are kind of dazed because they they've been kind of slapped across the face by what's wrong. Um, but nobody has been able to help them really get a feel for what's right. Well, here we are in the political season where, of course, the Democrats are talking about universal health care and Medicare for all, et cetera, et cetera. What, how do you view all that? Well, the, you know, there's been 40 years of work to develop this universal health care, Medicare for all, single payer approach. And paying for health care is clearly important. But I think even in that approach, and the folks who've done that have done yeoman's work getting the public's attention to the payment process. But what's been left out is what the system should look like. You know, we, we see, we can argue back and forth about how to pay for it. And maybe you can pass a bill in Washington or in Boston to change how you pay for it. But what we haven't done is talk about what every person needs and every community needs. And that's what other nations have done far better than us. Uh, uh, would you say the medical community is in agreement with the fact that we're broken? I think there's wide agreement that there's a problem here. Um, you know, some people say broken. I try to get people to understand that we just don't have a healthcare system at all. What we have is a market, and the market is doing what markets are supposed to do, which is sell stuff and make profit. So we're really great, we're really successful at making profit, but I don't think that's what most of my colleagues want from the work that they signed up to do. Yeah. Most of my colleagues wanted to be in communities and to take care of communities. They didn't want to fill out forms and you know, sort of jump when their corporate bosses said jump. They didn't want to sit in front of these electronic medical record systems that have them paying attention to the computer and not to the patient. Almost all my colleagues want to be with and listen to the people who are their patients. Yeah. And they have been vastly alienated by this, this behemoth that seems to have a life of its own. I'm, for the, over the past few years, Michael, I've been thinking about the system, the market, as you describe it, and the role of insurance keeps coming up in my mind. And from what I can see, the insurance companies don't lend anything to the care of human beings. They scoop off 20, 30 percent, whatever, exactly from, right. from your health care dollars and offer it nothing. Is that correct? Well, I think they certainly offer nothing to the piece that's called primary care. Right. We know what your co the cost of your primary care is going to be. It's totally predictable expense. Um, and we know that every single person needs primary care. That primary care is an essential service that has a public purpose. So they certainly don't add anything to that. Mm -hmm. It may be that if we took that away from them, and that's 50% of the claims they process or 50% of the work they have to do, it may be that they may be a little useful in helping people who are struggling with big expenses um, from organizations or institutions that they only have to see once in their life. It may be that they may be able to bring something to the table for that but I think really only for that. Yeah, I, I wish we could separate the, the uh, role of the insurance company from the role of the healthcare providers. Um, I mean, I see the insurance as, as facilitating healthcare in a sense. Um, and it's certainly a big marketing element where they are always pushing their healthcare insurance. But I never, actually the strange thing is that people complain about not having health insurance. Right. That's not what I would complain about. I would complain about not having health care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, when I, you know, I talk a lot about primary care. Yeah. Because I think everybody ought to have it. Me too. And it's pretty simple. You know, it's what, it's the basic thing that everybody needs. 
as you said, the health insurance process costs 20 to 30 percent of what we pay for health care. The average cost of health care in the United States is now $11,000 a year. And the best estimates are that somewhere between a quarter to a half of that or about $5,500 a year is unnecessary or wasted. Ugh. So the health insurance company taking 20 to 30 percent um, gets about $2,500 of that $11,000. Um, you want to know, can you guess how much the primary care piece is of that $11,000? Yeah. It's just 5% or less, um, or five to $600 per person per year. Primary care is so inexpensive that we can't afford to give it to every single person. But we pay... The doctor who's going to be there or the nurse practitioner or the PA, doesn't matter to me so much. We pay the primary care person who is supposed to be available to you 24 hours a day, at least by phone, who should be seeing you the same day you're sick, who does your physical exams, who refills your prescriptions, who listens to you and knows you and your community and fills out the forms that you need to f fill out as, as awful as those forms sometimes are. Um, that person is getting one-fourth of what the health insurance company is getting. The person who's there for you at 2 in the morning is basically getting next to nothing. And the guys in the big office towers um, with $900 million a year salaries for their senior executives, they're taking 20 to 30% off the top. That's the problem. Um, or that's part of the problem. The real problem, as, you th as I begin to think about it, is a political problem. Absolutely. That we all have let them do that. Yes. You know, it's, it's kind of amazing to me that we don't have more. We haven't been able yet, but hopefully will. We haven't yet created the national movement we need to change this. Yeah. Because it's going to take a movement. It's not, you know, there are $3.65 trillion a year spent on health care. If half of that is unnecessary or wasted, that's $1.8 trillion, which, you know, one perspective is it's unnecessary or wasted. The other perspective is that's somebody's profit. Um, and so they're not going away just because we say, gee whiz, we don't like you anymore. Right. They're going to fight tooth and nail. They use 0.05% of that profit for lobbying, which doesn't sound like very much until you turn it into real numbers, that's $500 million a year is spent on healthcare-related lobbying in the United States. And that's one of the things that we have to watch out for because that's what upends democracy. The, the, our, our, our colleagues who are in government, particularly the elected colleagues, they get their heads turned by people with that much money. And so people with that much money and so government doesn't say, okay, you know, no more of these crazy drug prices. You know, uh, we don't say we're going to be a public option. We're going to have a public option. They have to do pretty much what the insurance companies, the pharmaceutical companies, the disease, the disease, uh, uh, the, the, the machinery, you know, the medical device companies, uh, and the, the, the physician groups, the professional groups who are, are part of this process, they tend to do what the so-called stakeholders want mm -hmm. instead of doing and taking care of every single American. people, And that's where this is so dangerous because that kind of concentration of money is what is really dangerous for democracy yeah. itself. And that's why on the flip side, if we're going to re resuscitate the democracy, we're going to have to build a national movement to change this. And the process of building a national movement is actually the process of democracy itself. Would you describe this as a crisis? Well, I'm cautious about the, I think it's the crisis of the boiling frog. You know, I, I, yeah. I'm sure you're familiar with the story that, yep. you know, if you put a frog into hot water, it hops out. If you put a frog into cold water and turn up the heat, it sits there. Um, until the water <laughs> boils and the, and the frog is boiled to death. So I think we're, we're the boiling frog. We don't perceive a solution. How far along are we in the boil cycle? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll give you some numbers. <laughs> okay. About 20% of average family income now is spent on health care. Wow. 
the prediction is that by 2025, it could be as much as 50%. And by 2036 to 2040, it's likely to rise to 100%. That's boiled to death. Yeah. You know, we cannot spend every single penny on health care, nor should we. Is there general agreement on, on what you're espousing? I, I, I think there's widespread angst. Okay. There's widespread perception there's a problem. But I don't think there's a real understanding yet of this simple solution that we can actually fix this thing, not by redoing how we pay for health care, not by trying to close down the insurance companies as much as I'd love to do that, understanding that that's politically almost impossible. Right. But if we just provided primary care to every single American, that probably is what we need to right the ship. Um, that by itself is powerful enough. Here's what it does. If you do that and, and do it in a way that changes, you know, sort of pr pr provides payment for primary care to all community health centers and primary care practices, um, then half of what the insurance companies process goes away. Wow. And the insurance company sh uh, shrinks in half. Um, we did some projections when I was in government in Rhode Island um, that looked at what would happen to hospitals if we uh, provided good quality primary care to all Rhode Islanders. And these projections, which were done by well-established actuarial firms like the Lewin Group and the Robert Graham Center, together they found that we would, close, we would, we would be able to close half of our hospitals, that we would need 50% less hospital beds than we have today. And hospitals consume 30 to 40% of the healthcare dollar by themselves. They did this in Denmark. When they started providing primary care to everyone in Denmark, they were able to close half their hospitals. Wow. Um, and so that's, and, and you know, because primary care is only 5% of the total healthcare spend, Nobody actually cares about it very much. And you don't need a hospital for primary care, do you? No, you don't need a hospital doctor's for primary care. Doctor's office? This is, a, this is a doctor's office or a community health center. Politically, try to take away anything from anybody. I know. And you get a reaction. Yeah. Which is, you know, 170 million Americans have uh, private health insurance. And when folks say, well, we're going to take away insurance companies, I think that gets people a little concerned. But when you give somebody something they haven't had before, that's politically a good thing. It's the, go the old chicken in every pot theory. Yeah. Now it turns out only 30 to 40% of, Amer of Americans have and use primary care now. So if we were really able to, and, and we are able to, if we figured out how to get it done, put one primary care center uh, basically on every block um, or certainly in every community, you know, uh, a place that's open from eight o'clock in the morning till eight at night, sees you when you're sick, is open on weekends, you know, does medical care, dental care, mental behavioral health care, um, lab, x-ray, physical therapy, all in one place. Um, think about what, how, how communities would react when it had this new opportunity than that that community hadn't had before. Yeah, that's the kind of thing that that is, I think, politically uh, doable. Um, Are you familiar with Volunteers in Medicine? I'm not. There's a um, an organization here in Great Barrington. By the way, the only one in the whole state that offers 100% free medical, dental, uh, eye care, whatever. To anybody that walks in the door. Fantastic. Yeah. That's the kind of model. I mean, that's how we're going to fix this. When communities themselves do this for themselves. Right. And, what, you know, and, and we build it from the ground up. You know, we've actually got uh, a situation in Situate, Rhode Island, where we opened the first uh, neighborhood health station in the United States, and we guarantee every single resident, 10,000 people, in Situate, Rhode Island, the most Republican town in the state. Really? Um, we guarantee every single person medical care and dental care and have been doing that for 20 years. Great. Making us the first place in the United States that's not 
uh, a Native American reservation or a prison where everybody's guaranteed health care. Well, now you know of a second one. They're, I mean, that's fantastic. Volunteers in medicine. I, the reason I know about it is I just, um, I'm, I'm retiring from the president of the board here at the station. And I'm, I'm now a driver for Volunteers in Medicine. Fantastic. And it's run mostly by volunteers. Yep. Uh, and the medical professionals donate their time, and that's why the cost is so low. Right. But um, it's a model. So, Michael, here we sit with a system that doesn't work for a lot of our people. It's not a system. It's a market. Thank you. A market that, that does not provide medi appropriate medical care to everybody. And you've you proposed a, a basic health care for everybody, and it sounds very appealing. I know there's going to be an enormous amount of resistance. Uh, what do we do? What's the process? How do we get this in place? Well, I think you laid it out by talking about Great Barrington. Um, what we need to do is do what they did in Great Barrington in Lenox and Lee and Pittsfield and Westfield. Um, you know, sort of spread it across the state. Yeah. You know, community by community, because that's where, you know, that's where the good people are. Grassroots then? Grassroots from the ground up. From the ground up. So we need to do that. I mean, I, uh, a couple of years ago, moved my health care to a community health center. And I think more of us need to, to move our personal health care to community health centers because the community health center movement um, is not for profit and has been around for 40 years, takes care of everybody, and that's what we want to support. We need to get people like you and others from Lennox and Lee and Pittsfield to join the board of the community health center right. and get the community health centers across the state to really work on not just taking care of the people who walk through their doors, but taking responsibility for the care of every single person, whether they've walked through the door or not. Um, we need to, to ask my health professional colleagues from nursing and medicine to help lead this yeah. because their moral authority is critical. We need to do this you know, in every community, in every state, and then we need to, to build some national work, so a national organization or two, um, to advocate for this approach. So, so you're saying, if I can rephrase, we start at the local level and, and it's done with community situations like the one you describe in Rhode Island and, and our VIM here in Great Barrington and then expand that. I mean, what strikes me is that I want to do a TV show about volunteers in medicine because right. I would bet that most people don't know about it. Yeah. Um, I'm yeah. encouraged, though. Well, do one about that and uh, do one about volunteers in medicine. Do one about your community health centers. Yeah. You have a community health center right around the corner. I didn't know uh, that. Most, most Americans don't know the community health center movement exists, yet it takes care of 27 million Americans. Wow. That's um, a wonderful idea for us to um, educate the public. I think well, that role of education, helping people understand some of the dynamics we just talked about, about cost and about freedom and about the impact on democracy. Right. You know, I think we've got to call all this stuff out so people begin to, to really see what's happening right before their eyes and hop out of that, of that getting hot water. You're, you're exciting me. I feel like I want to be an evangelist for this. You sound like you are. Uh, so a couple final questions on the time we have. What's the likelihood of success, and how long do you think it's going to take us realistically? The likelihood of success is exactly zero if we don't all pitch in and make it happen. You know, I can't predict whether people will, will pitch in and make it happen. But, you know, if you look at the history of the United States, our democracy has been revived, resuscitated every 20 or 30 years by broad social movements. We did it with the abolitionist movement. We did it with the movement for women's suffrage. Right. We did it with the labor union movement. We did it with the civil rights movement. We did it um, with the movement for marriage equality and the anti-war movement. You know, this is how we conduct democracy. Um, this is the strength of our, of the American experience. Um, and if we could do it for those, we can do it for this. And, and uh, uh, for the point, I would guess is that given resistance from the top, vis-a-vis -vis the f federal government. That's the only way I think this is going to succeed. 
I think that's right. No, that's great. And I think for healthcare workers of my generation, mm -hmm. this is our Normandy. You know, this is our chance to stand up and defend democracy because democracy itself is being attacked by this whole process of profiteering, of taking advantage of someone else's misfortune for their own personal profit. Oh, it's, it's heartbreaking, isn't it? Um, um, it's heartbreaking if we let it happen. I agree. Um, and it's, it's, it will revive us all if we get together and stop it. One final thought, and, and, and from my background of how things have changed. When I started to work for IBM way back in the early 60s, I, I had the Blue Crosses uh, in New England as a client customer, right? And I was told that they were not insurance. What? They were prepaid medical expense. The theory being that you put a little away, put a little away in, in an account with Blue Cross, and when you get sick, the, you, that changed somewhere along the way and became really cl uh, classical insurance, didn't it? Yeah, it did. Um, and I wondered why and how. It's probably buried in the annals of history. I think it is, it is buried like that. I mean, when you started at IBM, that also, the Blue Crosses of the world didn't cover primary care. Um, That's true. You bought your own primary care. You'd worked out your own relationship with your own family physician. Many family physicians, you know, I mean, there were some family physicians that were, you know, on the take, you know, were interested in profit. But most family physicians were in their communities and would, you know, they would take chickens for people who <laughs> right. couldn't afford medical care. You know, they would make it work in their own community. When insurance started covering uh, primary care, that's when the primary care enterprise went into the tank. Ah. Um, and that's what we can get back when we begin to understand that primary care um, is a essential service um, with a public purpose and not for anybody's private profit. I love it. Michael, thank you so much. You've given me so much food for thought and, and material by which to espouse a better process for, for our society here in the Berkshires. And I thank you very kindly for being here with us today. Thank you for taking the time and doing this. Great thank to you. see you again. Thank you, Michael. Thanks. We'll see you in, in September. Sounds great. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.